Hey folks, welcome to Bear Mountain today. Today we're doing an experiment on what the effects of temperature are on making the JDAM microbiology solution, or microorganism solution, JMS. And today's temperature, at least for the next several days, we're supposed to peak out at uh, near like 100 degrees. Our nighttime temperatures are dropping down maybe if we hit 60, but it's probably gonna be in the mid 60s. So that's kind of the range we're looking at. So. Let's uh, go in and we'll talk about, you know, what we're gonna use for the nutrient solution. And we'll show you how we make that. And then we'll come out here and we'll start to put it together in the bucket. So we're starting with a potato. This is a typical one that we'll boil up, it's just a russet. Uh, it's organically grown right here. So we're going to uh, basically boil it for about 22 minutes. And here is an example of a similar potato busted up. It doesn't have to be exactly 150 something grams. It's just a medium sized potato. Then we're going to go over here and we're going to add, we've measured this out in the past, but we're going to have approximately 15 grams. It's pretty close to it. Maybe add a little bit more to get 15 grams. We'll add the salt into here, mix it with water and use uh, just a hand mixer to basically puree it. And that will be our basic stock for our JMS batch. So we're just going to transfer this into a, a, a one quart jar and that'll be used for uh, putting into our stock. So this is it. It's basically a little less than a quart of blended potato with the salt solution into it. And this is what we'll pour into uh, our JMS bucket, basically through a strainer, like a paint strainer bag. So let's go out to the field and work on that part. Okay, we use well water. This is, a, it's pretty hard water, but it doesn't really matter in, in the microorganism solution. And we're just gonna fill this bucket up till we get about four gallons in it. That if you really looked at it, it's right about here where this little dark line is here. That's approximately four gallons. And this is just your typical bucket you get from a Home Depot or a Lowe's or something like that. It's a five gallon bucket. And uh, that's the basic water we're gonna be using. Okay, so the material we're gonna be using is what's underneath an oak tree and a maple tree. And this has been an area that's been building up leaf mold for a number of years. And this is the end of July, so things are still pretty dry out here. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get down to the surface level between the interface between the leaves and the soil and take that just top like half inch. That's kind of what we're looking for, half inch to an inch of well uh, organic material working its way into the soil. That's where a lot of the biology is at that interface. Now you don't, if you don't have this, what you can do is you can make a simulated version of it. As an example, if you have an aerobic compost pile that has been um, basically there for a long period of time, say more than six months, usually the soil that's underneath it, right at that interface, is going to have that same type of biology in it. You can also get it too if you, if you have some green grass that not run through a lawnmower shredded where it mats down, but green grass and weeds that are green and you pile them up maybe about six inches thick on an area of, of what would be good soil and then keep that damp for at least three to four weeks. You know, so that soil interface between where that green grass is that you laid down as it, as it decomposes out is going to encourage that same type of biology. So it's not as good as if you, you know, found, you know, good leaf mold soil, you know, in a, in a forested area or an area on your property where it's been accumulating for years, but it's still got a lot of good biology in it. So let's collect that and we'll go and make the JMS. So here's a classic area. As you can see, there's some fungal activity here. This is, uh, you know, it's got a lot, so it's got a lot of biology going on here. And this is what we're gonna wanna take. We're gonna scrape kind of that down. You can see a lot of that white. That's good fungal activity. Okay, which means, you know, we got a lot of decomposition going here and being the driest time of the year, uh, this is gonna be really good stuff. So I only need about a handful of this material. Well, look at that. There's lots of good stuff in there. I wanna get a little lower right to the surface level. Lots of roots in there. That's good stuff and that's what I'm gonna use. I only need about this much to make the batch. 
So the other thing about it too is it has a really nice earthy odor to it. So this is this is what I'm looking for. So after I take what I need, which I'm just going to take a couple of handfuls, put it in my can here, and then I'm going to cover this back up because I don't want the, uh, the area to be too disturbed. I don't need that much, just enough to get the batch going. Okay, so as you can see from here, what we got is we, this is the nutrient solution, which is the pre-mixed and uh, pureed potato, boiled potato with the salt. We have our leaf mold, our bucket of water, a lid for covering, and our paint strainer bag. Now what we do is we use these paint strainer bags. You can get them like at a home center, or hardware store, whatever, and they're nice, perfect mesh. And uh, this is kind of what we use to make sure we keep the major solids out of it and uh, allow uh, the a whole inoculant to basically kind of soak in the water for a bit. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this material here, I'm going to put a good handful in my bag, and then I'm going to put the uh, inoculant in last. Um, well, actually, this is the inoculant. I'm going to put the food and the nutrients in last, and then make sure that it's kind of mixed around in the bucket of water really well. Okay, so here's the inoculant. It's in the bag. It's about a handful. And this is uh, at the point now we're just going to kind of lean this over the side. Then we'll full, uh, flow the uh, nutrient solution into it. And since I've got only one free hand, we'll pick it up at uh, the point after I dump the nutrient through the bag. Now we're going to dump it through the bag so that the potato skins or any other solids that might not have got blended up well um, don't immediately go into the solution. What we're looking for is the liquid flow through the solution. So that's important note. Don't put the nutrient in outside of the bag. It's got to go through the bag itself. So the nutrients and the potato solution are in the bag. I'm just going to gently kind of maneuver it around, make sure it gets all wet. Now, there's two different ways you can do this, and, and both work really well. Some people take the nutrient and they put that in a separate filter bag and keep the inoculant in another bag. And after they kind of massage it into the water, what they'll do is they'll suspend it in the water and just leave it there until the batch is done. Uh, the way I do it is I've gone two ways here. If my inoculant is fairly dry, I'm going to try to leave it in the solution in the water for a while longer. So I will, after I get finished with the initial kneading of it, just kind of leave the uh, combined nutrient inoculant bag hanging in the water for several hours. Uh, you can leave it there the whole time or you can just pull it out. And uh, other times if the inoculant has a lot of biologic activity, in other words, it hasn't been really dry, what I'll do is I'll, uh, after I get finished massaging it in the water, I'll just remove the, uh, the inoculant bag because there's no point to it. Uh, the material necessary biology is already in the solution and it'll take off from that point. So you can make a batch without a bag hanging in the water. It's not an absolute requirement. It takes several minutes to kind of do this just to make sure it's in there really good. Okay, so here we are after several minutes of kind of letting the bag float around and kind of kneading it gently through the water. Now you notice I didn't put a stone or anything in the bag to make the bag sink. You can do that. Honestly, as long as the material is in the water, I'm okay with it. Used a couple of reusable zip ties just to kind of hold the bag and let it float in here for several hours. You may also notice too that there's a little bit of really fine material floating on the surface that, you know, kind of escaped through the mesh of the bag. That's not a big deal at all. Uh, mostly what's going to happen is the bubbles that are going to form, that's going to stay on the top of it. And uh, if you're going to use this stuff through a drip irrigation thing, you're going to filter it before you use it anyway to a much finer filter. So this has all got, those little pieces all have biology on them too. So it's, it's just all part of the inoculation process. So at this point, that's it. That's all we need to do. Uh, with the last step being, we're going to put a lid over the top. Now what I do uh, so I just use a, just a generalized lid. I'll, I'll use this like stake basically as a way of keeping a lid propped open. Make sure I'm not adding any extra crap. So what I want to do is kind of protect this from, you know, really bad UV getting in on the top. But the side will let light through, but it's not going to let much UV through. So the side's opaque, 
Um, this whole bucket is out in the is going to be out in the sun during the course of the day, and uh, we'll just see how fast it goes. So at this point, we are at uh, 9:30 in the morning, and if this goes well, I should be able to spread it right around sunset tomorrow night. So we'll see if it makes it. Like I said, it's going to be 100 today, 102 tomorrow. Uh, we're going to get down to maybe 60 to 65 at night. And so this should brew up pretty fast. And for the Pacific Northwest, this is really fast. Okay, folks, this is the inside of the bucket. And we are at 10 hours since we inoculated. And today's temperature was nearly 100 degrees. And you can see, look at the foam activity that started on this guy. Um, it's probably going to be ready within... It'll be 24 hours at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, or excuse me, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. And this stuff is probably gonna be ready to go within uh, that 24 hour period. Foam is really building up nice. Okay, so here we are the next morning. This is after our nighttime temperatures drop down to about 60. And what you can see around the edge is there's still biologic activity going on right in here. And even though some of the foam and the bubbles have popped, things just slow down overnight. So we are at now um, approximately 24 hours. And we're going to let this thing go till we get to between 30 and 35 hours. Because I think as the temperatures begin to heat up again, there's still a lot more uh, food source in there for these things. And so there's probably uh, some more growth. So probably what happened over time, at nighttime it slowed down and then it'll speed back up again. So this will be ready for application in the evening and that'll be approximately at about 35 hours. So one of the things to note about this is they always talk about in the, in the books or any other publications that you always see this clear ring around the outside. That is not necessarily always the case, particularly when we have high temperatures the outside is actually warmer than the inside of it. You don't get that necessarily convection uh, system flowing inside the bucket. And so what we've noticed is, is that with, you'll get that clearer ring when the solution temperature is at or slightly above the ambient temperature. But when the ambient temperature is above the solution temperature, um, there's a transfer going on, but it's not, it's not such that you're getting that convection current moving in it. Uh, doesn't mean that the stuff is not working, doesn't mean it's bad, it's just different. So if you don't see that clear ring, but you see a lot of foam, or you see a lot of biologic activity that says it's still alive, it doesn't smell, or anything of that nature, it's still good. So you just gotta keep, you know, keep the faith, so to speak, and, and watch the process go through. Well, folks, here we are at 34 hours, and you can see that we have gone way past peak. This was, again, 100 degrees today. So basically, with a 100-degree Fahrenheit day and about a 60-degree Fahrenheit, lo Fahrenheit low in the morning, um, this stuff was ready probably in about 15 hours. So realistically, I should have used it last night at about 10 hours. Uh, before it got dark and although it was still looked reasonably okay this morning I thought maybe it'd fire up again turns out it didn't and um, what I'm left with now basically is a JLF solution so the bottom line on all this is is that you can make the JMS in a really hot environment now this was this bucket was left in the Sun and clearly it did really get rocking and rolling and was pretty much done, like I said, in about 10, between 10 to 15 hours. And uh, it probably hit its peak at that point. So I started it at nine o'clock in the morning. So if I'm looking at doing this again on my next heat wave, I want to start this at about six in the morning. So it'll be at about 12 to 14 hours uh, by twilight. So it'll be done in one day. Now, to give you a contrast, when I'm doing this in spring with ambient temperatures maybe hitting a high of 60 degrees Fahrenheit and in the day and going down to 40 at night, this could take up to three days just to get to a point where it's hit, hit its peak. So it makes a huge difference. And in those cooler temperatures, you definitely do get the, the clear ring around the foam. 
but in the hot temperatures there was no ring and that's basically because the ambient difference between the ambient temperature outside the bucket um, to the material that was in the bucket I think didn't, didn't allow that convection to start um, right on the outside. So it's not that it was bad, it's just that you really have to kind of be aware that not all circumstances are the same. So the whole point of this experiment was to show that what you can do is you can do this in extreme conditions and you're going to get a different type of microbe, much larger bubbles, and the material uh, moves much faster in a cold environment. It tends to move slower, bubbles are smaller, but both solutions have their place. So I want to thank you guys for watching today, and as always, stay safe out there, and we'll catch you on the next video. Bye-bye.